the Quinn Mar Show. This show is brought to you by Bing Pot Trivia. How many times have you been to a trivia night where it just felt like somebody reading questions? Well, Bing Pot Trivia prides themselves on bringing high energy, dynamic hosts to every event. The show leans heavily on visual elements. Their questions are designed to make you laugh or roll your eyes, while also challenging your knowledge on pop culture, high school science, culinary arts, and everything in between. Their typical show runs five rounds, including a photo round, general knowledge on pop culture, riffs on different game shows, absurd 50-50 questions, and a super sweet music round. Check out bingpottrivia.com today to book your trivia night. Again, that is a bingpottrivia.com. Tell my boy Danny that your friend Quinn sent you. All right, let's get on with the show. My next guest was first introduced to the world as Christina Brown, the six-year-old British pest that scared away her nannies. Since then, she's completely flipped the script. Now you can find her interviewing other child actors, posting on her Instagram, and giving out free autographs to the streets of London. <laughs> my pleasure to welcome to the Quinn Mar Show, Holly Gibbs. Holly, how's it going? Good, how are you? Thank you for that lovely intro. I, I'm good, and yeah, no problem at all. I, I appreciate you coming on here. It's been a lot of back and forth with us. I know, we've been happen. trying to arrange this for weeks. Yeah, <laughs> so, so I'm, I'm excited to finally be able to talk to you. So um, first things first, obviously, you are from London. So I just wanted to get into like growing up um, in London and like what a young Holly was like. Were you into sports? Were you into books, movies? Like, give me the whole lowdown on that. Okay. Yeah, I've, I've been brought up in London my whole life. I don't live in like central, sort of more towards the suburbs. If you're a football fan, I grew up in an area called Wembley. There's a big stadium there. Um, I don't live there anymore. I live sort of close by to there. But me growing up, I really was just like always like that kind of like stage child I was like always performing for my mum putting on shows when I was younger I loved to sing and dance I cannot sing and dance but I really enjoyed it I went to drama group every weekend and I was never a sporty child I was never like I didn't do any of that extra extracurricular stuff I was like very much just like any chance to kind of like sing dance act put on a show get dressed up all of that stuff um because I started when I was so young so it was kind of like all I really knew when I was growing up I was very theatrical and very dramatic if you look at like my uh home footage from when I was a baby every clip is just like me put the camera on me that was me as you a had child. to be the center of attention yes at all times my poor brother it was a nightmare that I, was my life so you I'm, it sounds like you're a, a pretty girly girl yeah, I guess so. I was like, definitely Princess Vice, but I actually, my bedroom when I was younger was half pink and half blue. So oh, I feel like yeah. I was kind of with the times. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like gender norms. Yeah, just... yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. You said you had a brother. Yeah, do you have quite early brother? though, I think. Do you, do you just have the one brother? I have an older brother and I have a half younger brother as well, okay, but he lives yeah. somewhere else. So in my house, it's me, my mum and my brother. Oh, nice. Okay. What yeah. did, um, what, are, what are your brothers doing now, like career wise? just normal jobs normal you know stuff, yeah yeah they're just like living the normal life and i'm just like here you know selling my soul to the internet yeah, Everyone yeah. Else is normal. i'm doing the same thing look what we're doing right now <laughs> literally i have a big sign beside me saying the quinn Mar I show love the sign yeah, the sign I'm is great sure. i need one of those I appreciate my, i'm actually my my two friends from work just got it made for me and um uh surprised me with it that's so nice it's so legit yeah and i i mean it's a little bit of uh of like telling spelling secrets but this this wall is like a fake wall oh um yeah so it's you would it's, never know this I is know. not fake this is yeah, very yeah, i know that see that looks sick <laughs> it's real brick <laughs> i'll send you pictures after of like the actual like what the rest of the room looks like it's uh, okay it's, it's pretty good how it's how it's fake like this but um, yeah that's really cool you would never know yeah well i appreciate that um yeah so you growing up and like getting into acting obviously your mom was an was an actress what did mm. you what did your dad do my dad he passed away two years ago but my dad when i was growing up was a music producer oh wow yeah he produced the song return of the mac by mark morrison oh, okay yeah yeah yeah, yeah. That song. that's my dad's song no way. um yeah and then he kind of like left that behind and went into something completely different but my parents split up when i was six okay. so i grew up like mainly predominantly with my mom i've lived with my mom my whole life my dad like moved to the countryside um 
but my, I come from a very creative family. Like okay. my mum was an actress. And by the time I was born and like growing up, she'd transitioned from acting into casting and her and her friend made their own casting agency. And now she's a casting director and that's what she's done like my whole life. But when my brother was growing up, we have quite a big age gap. My brother's like almost 10 years older than me. Oh, wow. When he was growing up, she was an actress and she like did really well. She was like in all these things. She was in like yeah, some- was. I, I, was looking right? her, I was looking at her IMDP page earlier and it was funny because I know that because you're a 97 and I'm looking through her IMDb page and the last credited role at the <laughs> time before a big gap was 96. So I yeah. got pregnant with you, I'm assuming, right? Yeah, literally. I actually think she got offered a really big role for something and then found out she was pregnant with me and couldn't do it. Yeah. Sorry. No, <laughs> you know, hey. one yeah. Um, but yeah, she like loved it. But I think, you know, it's such a hard industry. And I think the way that her company started I think she had like had some experience assisting casting directors before and then her and her best friend were like why don't we do this and they've done it ever since so she made the move and I think she's much happier growing up you know she was she's always been very encouraging my mum is like my biggest supporter but she would, was very honest with me like please don't try to be an actress like please just like find something else that you love this is going to be really hard and I did you know appreciate the honesty because I think yeah. a lot of people don't know she has such like first-hand experience of how hard it is to like make it a full-time career well yeah and then like you kind of had that like in your back pocket like you, you were lucky enough to have that in your house so if you ever mm. needed like the like help in like a direction of what you wanted to do you had that help mm. right there to ask right so oh my god it's amazing having a casting really director cool. in your house to do self tapes is like yeah. The oh yeah true i wasn't even thinking about the casting director part i was <laughs> thinking about the acting part yeah that's so true yeah she did she'd be like right a bit more like this giving me great i mean it has caused some arguments i'm not oh, gonna yeah. lie having a mom direct you is quite intense but yeah it was so helpful she really like helped guide me through my whole career that's cool so yeah. for her how did she get into acting it was similar to me she just like always loved performing and growing up there's a sort of organization in the uk called the national youth theater which has changed a lot now but it kind of like started as this like youth club for kids who were interested in acting and stuff and it was free and it was this big program but like quite hard to get into and quite prestigious and if you got in you would like go on tour and do all these shows around the uk and my mum like grew up doing that she went to Guildhall, which is like one of the best drama schools in the country and yeah, I think it was similar to me. She always just like, she she also did a bit of musical stuff, singing and dancing. Like my whole family is very creative. Like even my extended family, there's like musicians and directors and producers. I feel like we have that gene in, in somewhere in our pool and everybody is like quite creative, which is really nice. Yeah, that's really Makes Christmas cool. really fun. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. You guys are just putting on plays and musicals yeah. and stuff at Christmas dinner. Literally charades goes crazy <laughs> oh, in my God. family. You guys must be <laughs> amazing at charades. Yeah, it's oh. a good time. I love that. So then for you, is that like, was it the theater program that like you started your acting in then? No, not at all. I was always just like very loud, you know, love to put on a show. And the first job I ever got, I got through my mom. And I want to make it really clear. I am not an ever baby. That's the only <laughs> job she ever got me. And my mom does do casting, but she does commercial casting, like TV commercials. Like that's her bag. That's what she specializes in. And there was a commercial she was working on for Play-Doh and they needed a little kid to run around in a fairy costume in this like Play-Doh universe. And she helped get me the job. So that was my first job. I think I was five and I was literally just like running around this set that had been built out of Play-Doh in a fairy costume. It was so much fun. Yeah, and wow. then from that, she signed me up to like a sort of local drama group that was run by an agency. So a lot of the kids who went to the drama classes were also signed with the agency. And because my mum works in casting, she often knows about some of the jobs that are going around. And she'd heard from another agent about Nanny McPhee. And she approached my agent at the time and said, you know, I've heard about this amazing film. They're casting all these kids. Can you get Holly an audition? And my agent, for whatever reason, didn't want to suggest me for the film. We don't know why. She just didn't want to put me up for it. So then this other agent was like, I'll put her up for it, which is like a bit illegal and like not really common practice. But I basically went for the audition through this other agency. Huh. And when the first audition started, it was these like big group castings. You'd like go into a room, there's like 30, 40 kids, all just like mad in this big room. They kind of split you into little groups and then people will come around and interact with you and watch you. And like, I think there were like, I think there were eight auditions in total. And slowly the big groups got smaller and smaller and smaller until like 
eventually it was sort of like the core cast that were left and that's when like Emma Thompson came in for the last couple of auditions and like the director would come in and you know we'd like read together as the kids and sort of like test our chemistry but it was just like really through that agent suggesting me for the job that I like got into any professional work and then I got the job so how does that work like so you hear about a part or your agent hears about a part and they say hey like i i think my client would mm -hmm. should audition and they like kind of like they put your hat in the ring is that how it works it's it's a bit complicated like there's a sort of big database here called spotlight which is like what all of the professional work goes out and like if you're an actor you need to be registered to Spotlight and it's like a subscription service but you can't be on Spotlight unless you have an agent so your agent can put you onto Spotlight but you can't be a self-represented actor on Spotlight there are other platforms for like non-represented actors but if you're on Spotlight you have an agent so what will happen is like my mum for example is the casting director so a company will approach her and say we're shooting an ad we need these three people my mum will then put out the job on spotlight and say i need people like this then the agents come through suggest all the people that they want to suggest and then my mum will look through and say i want to see these people i don't think these people are right for it but that is more for commercials for tv and film it's can be a bit more complicated especially like the big blockbuster films right there's like a, a few agencies here that are like the prestige you know all the celebrities assigned to them and often these big movies are only going to go to those agents to see their clients because they want to work with like top name top level people they don't kind of want you know anybody new or anyone aspiring in the film they want a big name so it's like there's a bit of politics involved but yeah typically your agent will come across a job on spotlight and and suggest you for it and it's up to the casting director whether or not they want to see you interesting, interesting. Mm. so i know you said like obviously it's because she um she got pregnant with you but like what was the big thing with your mom that she just wanted to go from acting to be a casting director was it casting director like the initial thing she wanted or was it just yes. something that wasn't acting i think Casting really spoke to her because she enjoyed the industry, but I think probably more than anything, it was like stability. I would have to like really ask her, but I yeah, feel yeah. like, you know, she did well and like, that's great, but you know, she wasn't uh, an A-list celebrity. And I feel like to make a living off of acting when you're not that level, it's really hard. Like, you know, you see most actors, they have like some other vocation, they have some skill that they do. They have a business on the side, they have a nine to five and they're just making it work. It's like, you know, especially raising two children, and my parents going through a divorce, like being an actor and being able to do that. It's like really, really difficult. And I think she just probably grew a bit tired of it. I think like, you know, when you've been doing it for so long, it's a lot, it's like a really big commitment to like do for the whole of your life. And I think she found something else that she was good at and like inspired and excited by and thought I might as well do this. Do you ever go back and watch any of her projects? We have, yeah, we yeah. have. We have, and that's really fun because a few of the films she was in have like a bit of a cult following, oh, which really? is quite fun. Um, but yeah, we have definitely gone back and watched them all. She would say we haven't watched them enough. She's always like, "You never want to watch any of the things I was in." I have oh, seen really, them. yeah, See, I, I have would, seen them. I would find that most actors and actresses um, would rather not watch their stuff. Oh yeah, I'm like that. I don't want to see anything I've ever been in. Yeah, even though I was like when you were a kid. Yeah, like it's it just. Ugh, you give ugh. yourself the ick. <laughs> yeah, I do give myself the ick. Not so much the stuff when I was tiny. I'm like, oh, that's cute. But I have seen Nanny McPhee like 700 times. So oh, I like, you? oh, yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> love the film, but it's on right. every Christmas. And like, you know, that's great. It's amazing. So proud to be a part of that. But, you know, I have seen it enough times now. But the stuff when I was like in my teens just makes me feel uncomfortable that's fair no that makes sense yeah, yeah. It's, like, it's like watching a home video from when you're a kid versus like watching a video of like your buddy your friends took of you in high school it's like it's yes. not the same <laughs> no, right? yeah I try, I try to avoid so then for you like when you, if you like meet people like along the way do i know obviously you don't say hi i'm holly i was an amic fee but do people ever ask you or like does it ever get brought up in conversation you know what for like so long like when i sort of gave it up and I like went to art school and tried something very different. I just, I never talked about it. I would never speak about it. My friends from school knew, like people who were, who I knew when I was younger. But when I went to uni and I met all these new people, they didn't know. And then I remember one day someone found out and everyone's like, oh my God, like you're in Tracy Mika. And I was like, ah, yeah. Like I always just thought it was really embarrassing to, I would never like meet someone and be like, yeah, by the way, like I, I was an actress. I think yeah. that was 
so cringy and weird and like everyone right. would think I'm a freak um but no I never I never brought it up and then now obviously like it's all I talk about online which is just absolutely hilarious I mean I know and I love that and why wouldn't you I mean it's, it's an experience that like not many people get to say they did like you worked with like pretty big names like Colin mm. Firth Emma Thompson Angela Lansbury it's like it's not like any bad thing but yeah again it's funny yeah you wouldn't say hi I'm Holly have you seen any because I was in it right no I hate it even now I hate I hate, hate like I can do the kind of bit on in the videos but like you know if I interact with people like the ones where I'm interviewing people on the street and then they're actually like oh my god I like I love Tracy Beaker I'm just like okay like I don't, right. I don't know what to say yeah you, you enjoy it until it becomes an actual serious yeah literally <laughs> when it's a joke I'm like that's yeah. fine but if it's um, serious, can't. So for you then, like when you got the audition, I, I think that, or the, the role, it's crazy that there was eight, you went through eight auditions. I guess there were a lot of kids that they had. There to was try a lot of together. parts as well. There was like so many of us. That's true. How, Cause how many mm. kids were there? There's what, five, six? I think six or seven. I should yeah. So then for you, it was like, they, they put you in different groups with different kids to see like who meshed with who then, right? That's what you're saying? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then once you eventually got the part and then like start the filming, what was it like? being on set like for like a six-year-old seven-year-old holly and like because there are there's so many kids on there so it must have just been like fun right it was the funnest time yeah i had 14 weeks where i didn't have to go to school because we were filming. yeah and i was in year two which is like second grade but i feel like the ages are different so i was six i wasn't at school yeah I was just like living my life. I had a car come and pick me up every day to take me to set. The car had a TV in it. I was like living this crazy life because also, you know, it was a really big budget film and they really, really looked after the kids. Like they really made it like the funnest environment. We had like a truck with just like juices on it. There was like all this kind of like food or this extra stuff that they would bring in. It was just like so much fun. Um, I just had the best time and like yeah, it was yeah. shot part in a studio and the other part they built the house oh like, they actually built the house it's mad or like i don't know if they built it from scratch but they like repurposed a, an actual house oh, so like that house is an is a house that exists and it was like sort of just outside of london and we'd go there and like it was in the summer and the weather was really nice and like my mum got to come to set with me i'm like i was doing school but because i was so young I was just like making collages and like That's coloring true. in. Yeah. <laughs> so it was like the best time ever. Did you guys all, I'm assuming you and the rest of the kids all just got along no problem? We did, yeah. But also they were really good. Like they made bonding days for us before we started mm -hmm. filming. So we all met up and like one day we went on the London Eye and then another day we went to like a little farm and held the animals. So they, they made sure that we had like time together before we started filming so we could like get to know each other. Because also there was quite big age differences. Like I was six I think I was the youngest or maybe Sam was a year younger than me I think he was I think he was five or six we were tiny and then the oldest kids would have been about 16 wow. so like there was a big gap in age and they were doing their exams while they were on set yeah, so wow. that's, that's a very good experience yeah. yeah you're sitting there making collages and they're, they're cramming for a test that sucks you know <laughs> You're talking, yeah, about, easy, you're talking about how easy your day was and they're over there stressing and sweating thinking about their exam yeah you're telling everyone your collage I'm like here's my drawing yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> and so i was mentioning how there was like uh pretty big actors and then even thomas like he ended up like mm -hmm. being in a lot of stuff like love actually was big uh yeah. the maze runner series so yeah and then did you know at the time about angela being mrs pot in miss Potts and beauty and the beast no no you didn't know that did you know that no. even now no have you, seen, have you seen beauty and the beast yeah but i didn't know that was her this is pots yeah oh my god i never put those together i knew that she was really famous because my mum was like that's angela lansbury Murder so i remember when i first met her i was like whoa it feels like yeah, a meeting yeah, queen yeah. but no, i never knew that, that was her yeah, yeah now you're gonna have to go back and watch it i am and listen to it so um for for uh after the film, because it would you say it was 14 weeks? So after yeah. the, the 14 weeks of filming, what kind of you guys must have had like a pretty big premiere because it wasn't just like I'm sorry, and this isn't even like a slight, but like it wasn't like it was just like a, a British film that was just gonna be like big in mm. like England, right? Like I'm Canadian and I and I went and saw it in theaters with my sister. So mm. it must have been like a pretty big uh, premiere back then, no? Yeah, they had a big one in London and then they had one in the US, but they only took like three of the kids. I think they took like the three oldest kids or something. Oh, that's all of us watching, yeah, you know, budgets, whatever. I'm fine. Um, <laughs> you had to go back to school. Yeah. 
I literally just went back to school and also the post of that film like there was so much like visual effects and stuff in it it took so long to make I think it was like two years from when we finished or like a year and a half from when we cut wow. and wrapped to it actually coming out so I literally just like went back to school like it was nothing yeah wow and yeah. then and then then like for you like the friends you had I know it might be hard to like remember but like having like the friends back then like did they think it was weird you're just in movies and like you were doing that kind of stuff I don't really remember anything about Nanny McPhee except they were really kind and they let me take my class to a private cinema screening of the film before it came out which was so cool yeah we got to like go to the cinema and watch the movie just like with all of my the people in my year at school and I remember that was really fun it was more like when Tracy Beaker happened that people started to be like oh like you're like an actress no one ever found it weird um but it definitely became like more of a conversation as I got a bit older and I kept doing things. It just wasn't a normal thing, right? No. Like, did you have any other friends that did acting or were you the only one? No, I had like the drama group that I went to was, there were other people there who were doing professional stuff. Right. So they're like there, there was a few other girls that were like in some movies and things, but no, I didn't have any other like actual friends who were doing any of any of anything like that. They were just like, at school right just doing normal stuff they they had soccer practice after school yeah. and you would go act yeah exactly um so then for a canadian that doesn't really know about the story of tracy beaker was is that a massive show in england yes it, it was huge it was like it was on a uh, sort of network called cbbc which is like oh, yeah. actually just like closed which is really really sad they shut oh. down but they were like the, if you were a kid you either that's like what you grew up on it's like okay. where all of the kid shows were hosted and tracy beaker was just like it just had this like massive following i think because it was s slightly like more grown up in its context and was like quite not not raw but like it was like you know it followed like the whole concept is like it's this sort of like care home where all these children are in care and you know they for whatever reason for all different reasons they've been you know not able to live with their families and they're like in the foster system and I think that like for kids at that time it was something that felt like a bit more meaningful than the other kind of kids TV I guess like it's like as we grew up and then like Disney came around and there were shows like Wizards of Waverly Place that like would talk about things that were like just bigger than like being silly I think that that's that's what the massive appeal was I think it like got a bit serious and let people be vulnerable and also like they were like really like present with like featuring people with disabilities or like my character everyone makes fun of me like hi you, like my character didn't speak so I didn't oh, have any yeah. lines and everyone makes fun of me but the story of that is that she had selective mutism and it was like a thing that she was battling and then I've had people message me as I've grown up saying oh I grew up with selective mutism and it was amazing for me to see someone who was like me on this show I think they did a really good job at like having a lot of representation of a lot of different types of children but yeah it was massive but when I got cast I never watched it and I remember being on the playground at school and I was like guys I just got the call I'm gonna be in something called Tracy Beaker and everyone was like oh like freaking out and I was like oh I should probably I'd like seen a couple of episodes to prep for the audition but yeah, I didn't really realize like how big of a thing it was. Wow, that's that's yeah. really cool. So then trying to play a character that didn't talk, mm. what was your like approach to that? Because that's obviously I'm assuming that's something you'd never done before. So yes. how did you approach that type of character? Well, I find this question is really funny because I feel like I don't think I really tried to approach it at all because I was seven and I <laughs> feel like <laughs> you know what? Fair enough. That's true. That's a good point. I feel like I've like always tried to intellectualize this answer and be like oh you know like it was an amazing experience to just like really like get into a role where I just had to use all of my facial expression and like part of that was true I definitely like you know when I would practice with my mom it was like you know I do like bigger faces than I would usually do and I would like kind of play things up in like my the way that I was using my eyes or my body language and stuff like that but I don't think I deeped it that much I think I thought oh, okay like I don't have any lines so like you know I'm gonna have to try and make this work somehow and it, like you know it was fun it was definitely a different experience to not have to go and sit through a script at the beginning of each day it was yeah, odd I don't, yeah I don't, I don't doubt it so you were in 10 episodes and then mm -hmm. uh you moved on to a couple other projects. So you were mm. in a couple of TV movies and shorts, right? Like I mm -hmm. think there was Secret Life, Talk to Me. So while you were going and doing these projects, is that when you joined the drama group? When when did that come into play? 
Oh no, I joined the drama group when I was like six. Oh, I was in okay. drama groups from like the age of six. That's like oh. what I did on the weekends. And I was in the first one with the agent who didn't want me to go for Nanny McPhee. And then I moved to the drama group of the agent who got me Nanny McPhee. And I just did that. Like every weekend I would go, we'd put on shows, we would like practice. I would sing, you know. You were talking about how your brother just has like a normal job. Did, did mm. he ever try to get into acting when he was a kid or he left that all to you? Yeah, you know, he, he has actually got a beautiful singing voice. Really? He's like an incredible singer, but he won't sing. Like maybe like once every 10 years, we'll like let him, he'll, he'll sing a song somewhere at karaoke or something and we'll, you know, all cry. But like a voice so beautiful, but he's not, he's not like that. My brother is not, not one to seek the fame and, and the glitz and the glamour. He's like a very different type of person in that. Like you do all that. Yeah, yeah, that was my job. Yeah, you, you you like being the center of attention at home, so he goes, you know, yeah. well, that's all her. Yeah, exactly. Um, a couple of years after Nan McPhee came out, a second one came out, and obviously it was a completely different family. But did you guys hear about it and think, oh, are we gonna like be in it again? I only heard about it, I think, after it had come out, oh. and I remember being like, oh, <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. I was very glad that it was like a completely different cast um and not that they just decided to not use some of the children that would have been right. horrible right but yeah it's like a whole another story and also like love love the whole team but the first one is much better yeah 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 i mean it's, it's hard to beat the original yeah it is yeah. um so after you did these these projects when did it come to the time like where you thought you know what i don't think i'm gonna do much acting anymore i don't know if it was a thought or sort of something I had no choice in really I feel like it was a gradual slow burn like I did a few things I would like do a, a sort of project a year I was always auditioning like always always auditioning I had an agent it just dried up I think it's re a really weird transition when you go from being like a very small child who is cute and outgoing and can learn lines and deliver them and like act to some degree and then suddenly you're at this weird middle age where you're not in your 20s, but you're not six. And the parts are more scarce because there's not as much work going if you're in that in-between stage. But also the competition is so much harder. There are like all of these girls that look exactly like you, that sound exactly like you, that have had more experience than you, or just, you know, a lot of the time also when you're a child, you're getting cast to be someone's child. And a lot of the time you don't look enough like the, the woman who's already been cast to play the mum. So they're just going to go with someone else because it looks more believable. I had a lot of that. Um, mm. And I think... Uh, the older you get, it's just so much more competitive. And I think for me, you know, having grown up with my mum, my mum, you know, I wasn't there when she was growing up, but from what we've spoken about, she was just all about acting. It's all she wanted to do. She was at the National Youth Theatre every day. She was putting on plays. She was auditioning, auditioning, auditioning. It's all she cared about. And I think I got to a phase where I really wanted to have a social life and going to auditions on the weekends became something that like I wasn't really looking forward to because I wanted to go out with my friends I started to get really into art sort of slightly later in school and that was something that I really enjoyed and I think it was a combination of like just being a bit tired of a lot of the rejection and like especially when I got to sixth form which is like the in the UK like the last two years of school before you go to university you do your big exams you kind of have to sit back and think right okay what am I going to do? And initially my plan was to either apply to drama school or to just not go to uni, get a job in a cafe and like try and be an actress. But then when I got to those two years, I took art as one of my A-levels and I just fell in love with it. And I was like, oh, like I haven't felt this passionate about something in so long. And in the UK, there's something called a foundation year when you, if you're like pursuing an arts career, the unis will offer you a free year and you go to the uni, you have to apply, and like it's very competitive, but it's free. And the idea is that it's to sort of bridge the gap between school and art school, because the way they teach art in normal education is so different from how they do it at university. So you go and do this year, where you basically try everything for the first time, you do a bit of fashion, a bit of product design, a bit of jewelry, a bit of everything. And then you can really figure out, because also a lot of people who don't go to private schools, like I didn't, 
you don't have access to all these subjects. So you might think I want to do art, but then you'll try product design. You think, oh, I want to make furniture. So they give mm-hmm. you the opportunity to learn what it is you really want to do. And my my thing was sculpture. And so I did my foundation year. And I remember I had an agent at the time and I said, you know, I'm going to take the year off of auditioning. I'm going to do this. And at the end, I thought I, I don't I want to stay. So I stayed and I did a degree at the same art school for three years. And that was all within like within like the sculpture stuff yeah i did my degree was in fine art but i specialized in sculpture that's really cool yeah and it was a lot of fun yeah so it's funny because when when you decided to take that that year to just check out what you wanted did you have any idea it ended up being with like sculpture yes i did actually oh you you already knew that that you you had an interest in it okay fair enough yes in school i I was never a very good, I'm not, I'm not good at drawing. I'm not like a, a good, I can't, I can do some fun sketches, but I can't draw realistically. And I think in school, art is valued on how well you can draw. Like realistically, the people who you think are good in art at your year are the ones who can draw a face that looks like a person. Right. And I couldn't do that. And my, I had an amazing teacher and he said, Holly, I think you should try, you know, making some sculptures. And I was like, okay. And I did. And it was like much more me. It felt much more fitting. And so I always had an interest in it. And going into my degree, I knew that's kind of what I wanted to pursue. And I did. So there, there's a bit of a uh, a gap for me for mm. like doing research on you from acting to now doing your, your YouTube series mm-hmm. and of course social media. So between that year of you uh, getting your degree to when you started from early, which we'll get into, what were you doing in that time frame? Working, babe. Yeah. I'm, I've been working. Is a regular nine to five? I've actually not I'm not a nine to five girl. I am now. I just got a I just got a full time job. Um it is still creative, but I've been ever since I graduated, I've been freelancing. I ju- I kind of fell into it. I finished art school and a very similar thing with art happened or a similar thing with acting happened with art. I finished art school and suddenly I was like, this isn't fun anymore. I don't feel inspired by this anymore. I think art is really weird. You go to this like super kind of like trendy uni and you're making all this work that you think is really important. And then you leave and no one wants you to be in a gallery show. And like I made really weird sculptures of like fish and stuff and like no one wanted to buy them. And I thought, well, how am I going to live um, off of this? I loved art, but I don't think it was like, I think I realized quite quickly it probably wasn't what I was destined to spend the rest of my life doing. And I didn't feel, by the end of my degree, I felt quite deflated. And so I knew I needed a job. And in my head, the the thing that made the most sense was to go and work for an artist. And that's what I did. I like happened to kind of fall into a few jobs. I started sort of doing like PA stuff and then like just grew in my freelancing career and I've ended up in production. So that's what I do now, I'm cr- creative producer, um and I've done that mainly for artists but I've just sort of moved more into the kind of like creative content social media branding side of things which I really enjoy and it's a lot of fun but yeah I've just I've been hustling I love all I do is like, I have people ask me if like TikTok is my job and I'm like what like I wish it was my job right. I don't really because I, I love my career but um yeah it's It'd not a lot, it would be a lot easier though if yeah it'd be great your job. yeah yeah amazing yeah, so like, um, I I do want to get into the into your web show. Web show. Mm. What am I? Ninety? I don't know why. I call it <laughs> Jeez, I don't know why I called it your web show. Jeez, the internet just started. Um, but I do want to get into, and we talked about this earlier, is Mob Handed. So you did do okay. a movie with your mom called Mob yes. Handed. Can you give me a description of this movie and your um <laughs> uh, your opinion on the movie? Well, this film it was directed by a man that my mom knows somehow i don't know how he's lovely him and his wife they make these films together and they're making this film it's quite a uh, sensitive topic it's like about child trafficking um i was the child and fun fact it was actually filmed in my house and oh. in this very room we filmed a scene where i was ve- very badly hurt by a very bad man so that was really weird doing that in my childhood bedroom. Um, yeah, it's an interesting movie, but my mum was was in it too, uh, and they shot it in our house. It was all just a bit of fun. What, why? I guess your was the reason uh, your mom decided to do it was because of her friend being the director. Yes, because that's her. That was her <laughs> first thing in twenty years. Yes, literally, he was like, "Oh, can we use your house?" Also, like, do you want to be in it? And she was yeah. like, "Why not?" It's did a good time. Any, for her. Did you do scenes with her? 
No. Oh, I think our parts cool. were like very like not kind of in the same storylines at oh. all. I can't even remember who she played, to be honest. Oh really? No. <laughs> <laughs> That, that that's how much the movie meant to you at that point. Yeah. <laughs> I do not I don't think I've sat through the whole thing. Yeah. I'm not gonna lie. I was um, so yeah, you do have a show called From Early where you mm-hmm. interview child actors. And um I do wanna like that's a really cool concept because it's not just like what I'm doing as like a regular guy who just is a fan of the people I'm mm-hmm. I'm interviewing. You have the hand in that like you were a part of like you were doing you were them, right? You know mm-hmm. what they went through. So where did the idea of the show come from? Well, really, I like during lockdown, I made some TikToks about being in Nanny McPhee and Tracy Beaker for a bit of fun. And a few of them really picked up. And all of a sudden I had like followers and I didn't really know what to do with it. And for a while, for, I'd say for about six months to a year, I literally just like every two months would make some sort of video to a viral sound talking about being in Nanny McPhee or Tracy Beaker. And it got to a point where people were commenting on my videos like, we get it. They still do comment that. They're like, we get it. Please talk about something else. But I like was not looking to be an influencer I didn't want to make that kind of content um but I've always wanted to make stuff you know I'm like so passionate about film I'm so passionate about tv like my job is production I like have a very like creative mind and outlook on things and I've always wanted to make my own things like you know my dream is like one day to like be able to I'm writing a play like I have all these like ambitions of things that like I want to make so I thought okay how can I spin this in a way that's just like slightly more interesting and allows me to gauge engage with other people I've always been like interested in the concept of presenting something and so one day I was just like in bed and I was like oh god like obviously I should just interview other people who are child actors like duh yeah. and so I reached out to Jack Edwards who I was in Tracy Beaker with he kind of played my on-screen best friend to do the first one and I just really wanted it to be something I just I think I just saw the level of interest of people online like I would get all these comments asking me all these questions about you know my experience and what it was like on set and things about the shows and I was like well I literally did no work and completely flopped and I there are so many people who did the most amazing things and I'm sure that they would be even more interested to, to hear about their experience so that's where the idea came from but I will say getting yourself into such a niche is really hard to like make something grow right right because my the issue i have is now it's very difficult to get people to come and talk to me i think for two reasons number one a lot of child stars are really famous and they don't want to sit down with someone who's got a thousand youtube subscribers because i don't i don't do it on zoom like i was very like fixated on the kind of visual aesthetic of it. Every episode is shot somewhere that's supposed to kind of evoke childhood memories. We've done a playground, we've done a pottery painting episode, biscuit making. Mm-hmm. I want it to feel visually stimulating. Like someone I'm like obsessed with is Amelia de Moldenberg. Like everything she does, I just think she's like an absolute, the girl who does chicken shop date. I think she's oh, a genius. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, she's a genius. And like, that's the kind of like level of stuff that I aspire to be able to make one day. So I didn't, I like, I was really particular about the kind of setting that I wanted, but getting the people I want to talk to to come and do that with me for an hour when I have no budget and I'm doing it all myself is hard and then also the people who maybe are not at that a-list level don't want to talk about the stuff that they were doing when they were kids because they're trying to move past it and do something else which I get so I'm in this really weird in between space if you know anyone let me know yeah I mean hey like I I know you mean because I have had um people and for me it kind of sucks because like a lot of the time being in Canada, the people I want to talk to 99% of them either aren't in Canada or if they mm. are, they're just in a different province and aren't even close to me. So it's a lot more difficult, but I also have like bigger named um, people that I, that I've talked to that were in like big Disney channel shows and they, they, they are, they're willing to come on, but they want mm-hmm. to be paid, which yeah, I, that's I, the I, thing. I have a regular nine to five job. I don't have the money. I, to say, I can't pay you. Cash. Right. I have emailed. I emailed some, I won't say the name, but I emailed a reality TV star who got famous young. She is famous, but like she wanted 7,000 pounds for an hour of her time. And I thought, who do you think I am? Yeah, I've been I've been told that it was been a thousand dollars American to, that they want to come on for an hour. It's mm-hmm. like if I if I had the money, I would do it. Yeah, but like, I too. don't I, it's again, no. it's uh, uh, not that it's a hobby, but like this is something that like it's not my all day every day thing so i was like no i don't have yeah. money for that so no. for you i how do you have like such like like the production of your videos are so good and like when you're doing these interviews how do you get all that together not that being your main source of income um i've been very lucky and i've worked with a few videographers who have been very generous with their time 
I always believe in paying people, but I've like managed to find people who like believe in the idea and like are willing to, you know, work for a rate that doesn't bankrupt me, which is really nice. Also, I feel like, like I've kind of had like hack, this is maybe going to sound terrible, but I feel like working with like younger, more aspiring people, like never for free. People should never work for free. That is my opinion. But like, I feel like younger people who like are still kind of looking for that experience. The first few episodes I edited myself and like, I'm not an editor. And then when I did the episode with Eliza Bennett, I really wanted to bring someone in. So I found somebody who was like, it was a lot of money, but I was like, this is worth it. Like, you know, sometimes you have to make the investment. I just been paid at work. I was like, right. Okay. You know, this is, I, I think how much did I spent on that video. I probably like total cause I hired a venue. I probably spent like 600 pounds on that video. Wow which is like a lot like yeah. you know, for anyone that's a lot of money especially like when there's no return i'm not getting adsense from youtube i've got a thousand subscribers like there's right. there's no you're return just, to... you're sorry yeah. sorry to cut you off you're just at the point where you can slowly get a little bit of money from youtube because you need the thousand subscribers and then yes. i can't remember the watch time are you, are you, are you, thousand are you, hours of watch time are you at that or no no i'm not <laughs> no. no really I think I'm like halfway. Oh, okay, fair enough. Yeah, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but yeah, no, I, I, okay. I, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, it's, it, it, it's, it's it's hard. It is. It's a lot, and also I'm not gonna lie. Sometimes I think like, what's the point? Mm -hmm. Like I, I do get, I do like get to that place. I think there's this like really like toxic narrative that if you're like a creative person, like you can never not believe in your ideas, and you always have to be like 100. Like you know, I am like a working human being. Like I have bills. I have like a life that I need to build. I have like a very like intense job, especially when I was freelancing. It's a lot of work to like balance all of this stuff and. I've always like managed to make it work through like the people that I've met or like just you know happen to have got a bit of money from somewhere and like you know just like invest it into that but like you know you can't be doing that on a like weekly basis it would be impossible I would never be able to do that right. so it's it's like a tricky I, I honestly thought when I started I was like <laughs> one year top podcast on Spotify like 100% I was like cool like this can't be that hard and then it's the people that is the hardest thing getting people to do it is yeah, so yeah. hard. It, it, it is very difficult. Like, mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm lucky that I just took a bit of a break, um, about a month break. So I could, uh, pile on like in stock interviews. So I'm now mm -hmm. about, I'll be about four weeks ahead oh, that's as good. I'm getting more interviews. So, which is nice because I had to take the break. Cause there came to a point where I think I got too cocky and lazy that I would, I thought I could get them quicker. Mm -hmm. and yeah and more frequent and that didn't happen so i now yeah. i'm trying to do as many as i can in like a certain week and then i'm six seven weeks ahead that's really good yeah so that's that's kind of what i'm trying to do because like you said the hardest part is getting the people and especially i think it'd be yeah. even harder for you because you need them with you on like a set or like yeah. right you know what i mean like yeah it'd be right. more difficult for you and all the people i've interviewed so far i have sort of known to some degree like mm -hmm. You know, a few of them have been for Tracy Beaker. Eliza, I was in Annie McPhee with. She happened to be in London. She lives in LA. And I asked her if she would do it. She said yes. There was a boy that I interviewed called Daniel. He was in um, Outnumbered, which is a really big show in the UK. And I sort of had a mutual connection with him through somebody. But, you know, also it's a different game when you approach people who have agents. Because, like, what agent in their right mind is going to get someone to go on my podcast when I can't pay them? I don't have a big following. Mm -hmm. They're like, what's the point? Like... Right it's almost like they, you know, you have to get to the kind of like million subscriber mark and then they'll be like, oh yeah, we'll come and do it as promo for her next movie. It's like not an easy game to be playing no. at all. Um, it is a really good idea though. Like that, the concept you came up with, because like Thank I said, it's, it, it, it's not, it, you don't see that everywhere. Right. Um, yeah. It's funny that you talked about child actors and like, as they are um, adults and not acting anymore, there's an American movie. I don't know if you've ever seen it. Have you ever seen it? A movie called Dickie Roberts, former child star. It's, no. it's with it's with david spade and um his character is a former child actor who's still trying to like be big later on he's doing all these like like celebrity boxing that kind of stuff okay. just to say, irre to say relevant um and it actually has real child actors from like shows like the brady bunch um the partridge family all that and it's it's a comedy but it's you should watch it. it's actually really I will watch that that sounds amazing yeah it's like it's a it's pretty old like it's probably like 20 something years old now i remember okay. watching it as a kid but no it's it, it, it's a good movie and that makes me think about your show and what you were saying how you weren't that cute little girl outgoing girl anymore and you were kind of in like that middle weird area so mm -hmm. that, yeah you should watch that movie and let me know what you think because it, it I is definitely will. yeah um, the amazing. last couple of things i have for you is 
I don't know. You, you have you taken like a break from the show? Like you have, is, have you posted recently? Not, not by choice. I haven't posted anything. Not by choice. I've been trying to get interviews. You know, I've been trying to get somebody to do it. There's a lot of kind of like, you know, it almost happens and then it doesn't or like, oh, we're, we're going to do this and then it doesn't. I like, I, I'm trying. And like my goal for the year is to kind of like put things out on a more consistent basis and like perhaps rethink like the strategy that I'm having. But also like, I don't just want it to be actors. Like, I feel like there's like a lot of stories of like musicians that started as children, people in business, entrepreneurs, athletes. Like, I, I just think like, I think the story of like starting something professionally young is so weird and I think that like it really can create a level of complex in a person or like you know really kind of like impact the trajectory of your life I feel like I don't have a, a huge insight in that because my career kind of came and went very quickly and like you know I didn't I'm not a superstar celebrity and like I'm you know not addicted to class a drugs or anything like that like I'm fine mm -hmm. but I'm really interested in sort of like the psychology of like how the way we grow up especially when it comes to like employment and how that defines you I feel like I felt very like reluctant to kind of really tell people or even myself for a long time I was giving up on acting because it just felt like my identity like growing up that was like who I was it was like oh she's that girl that was in that film she's the actress da, da, da. and then when it came to the point where you know it, it kind of all stopped for me I like would still oh no no like I'm acting oh no no I'm gonna go to drama school because I didn't really know how to give that up and I can't imagine what that's like for someone like Simone Biles you know like yeah, on yeah. how like being so young and known for one thing like impacts like the whole of your identity growth as an adult I find it so interesting absolutely and so do I mm -hmm. that's why I'm doing the show that's why you're sitting here talking to me right now um a yeah. couple more things before I let you go one and you can you can say no to this mm -hmm. um, I did see you one of your episodes where you did an American accent and you did it really well and you <laughs> say how you didn't which which was weird because I thought you did good can you try to do can, can you say something in an American accent and like yeah sure the only American accent I can do is a Valley Girl accent because it's which, the which easiest I think is my, one. that's my favorite I think that's hilarious. it's the easiest one right. all of the sort of like you know try to do a New York accent impossible but like I don't know what to say hey hey let's <laughs> get into it okay hey guys it's Holly Gibbs I'm here on the Quinn Mar show today that was terrible no that was really see, bad. I, 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 I it's very whiny. Like they just talk. It's like, oh my god. Like, let's go to Erwan and like get a Healy Beaver smoothie and like totally like we should go on a hike later. Like I, I like I can't. Like that's just how I they talk. What are you talking about? That's so good. Like I could never do a British accent. Like no, that's amazing. You, it's like when you see actors like Tom Holland, how he can switch that Brooklyn yes. accent and the British accent like nothing. Incredible. Who was I saw? I watched um. It's Saltburn, and I thought Jacob Elordi, mm -hmm. his English accent is fantastic, and he's Australian, which is would it be harder. I don't know, you know, would it be harder to go from something like Australian to British than it would be from like American and British or British to American? I feel like I think that American to British is very difficult because I think just the way that we like the sort of like inflections on like letters and sounds are so so different. That's so I think that. When, yeah, when an American actor can do a really good English accent, it's very impressive. You don't see it very often. No, they're usually terrible. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, um, it's funny because in Canada, like, uh, when people say, like, I have an accent, but uh, in, like, a different province or even, like, a different, like, town sometimes, like, someone will sound completely different than me. Like, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's funny how accents work. It's, like, literally just because the people around you, that's why you sound like that. It's bizarre. It's yeah. bizarre. Um, you were in New York recently. Was that for social media? Was it for? No, I wish. What well, was it? Just for, <laughs> was it for like your your job? Yeah, it was for work. My company is based in New York, and we had some projects. So oh, no, I feel very no. lucky. I was flown out. It was really nice. That's, was that your first time there, or had you been there before? No, I have quite a lot of family in um, New York. And when oh, I was really? eighteen, yeah, I interned in New York for three months when I finished um, art. Oh no, That's just sweet. before I started art school. So I went to live there for three months. That's, so that's really, really cool. Yeah, I love it there. All right. Well, before I let you go, Holly, please, if you have anything to promote, anything you want to talk about, your social medias, the, the, the floor is yours, the promoter. Uh, um, <laughs> Where people can find I you. Anything to promote because I don't post consistently. But if you want to follow me on TikTok, that would be so cool. I've been at 49.9 thousand followers for like weeks now. So like, you know, let's oh, – I suck at this because I just, you know – one day I'll have an episode of From Early and you should watch that with whoever it's with. 
Exactly. Go subscribe on YouTube to your Instagram, follow on TikTok, all of that. Holly, thank you so much for coming on here. It's been amazing. It's been really cool to be able to talk to you and just you too. hug you about all the most random stuff. So yeah. I thanks. love it. Your questions are fantastic. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate that. And um, I will talk to you later. And again, thank you so much. I'm uh, I'm really excited for everybody to, to see this episode. So yeah, thank you, you so too. much, Holly. Cool. Thank you so much. I hope you have a lovely day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. And that was the Quaid Bar Show.